Welcome back to another episode of the Max Out Show, where today I'm joined by Dr. Procrastination himself, Dr. Timothy Pitchell from Carlton University. For the last 20 years now, Dr. Pitchell has been the leading authority in the world on goal setting and procrastination. So in this episode, we dive deep into what procrastination really is, why we do it, and most importantly, some practical tips and steps and tricks that you can start applying in your life to end procrastination once and for all. So I had a blast shooting this episode. Let's dive right in. Now, to pursue any field of interest for, for two or more decades, I believe you have to be incredibly passionate about this topic. So did you ever struggle with procrastination in your own life, or what's the reason you're so fascinated by this? Well, yes, the answer to your question, I did struggle with procrastination in my own life because it's part of the human condition, but that's not why I got why I got to studying it. I did my own doctoral research, my own PhD research on people's goal pursuit. And you mentioned that in the intro that my expertise is in goal pursuit. And I was looking at how that influenced our well-being, how happy we were, how satisfied with our lives, that sort of thing. And what became very obvious to me was that if I wanted to understand how people were feeling, I needed to know about the things they were said they were going to do and never did. The procrastination. Procrastination just loomed large in the interviews that I did and the data I collected. So quite literally, when I finished my doctoral dissertation defense, my external examiner said, so what's next, Tim? And I said, I'm going to stop studying what people are doing and start studying what people are uh, saying they're going to do and never do, because I said, that's the story of well-being. And that's where that passion comes from, because really what happens, and you know, it does relate to my own experience of it, we become our own worst enemy. And it's such a self-defeating behavior. So it fascinates me and it fascinates my students. And research is a way of teaching for me. And so it, I've never let it go because my students never let it go either. Well, I love that. I, th I think it's really such an important area of our lives, right, that we need to take care of. And so you already mentioned how procrastination affects our happiness. So can you tell us a little bit more about what the negative side effects of, of constant procrastination are? Sure. I want to start by saying that uh, procrastination is a certain form of delay so that there's delay in our lives all the time. When you first asked me to do this podcast with you, we could have done it right then, but we didn't. Yeah. We delayed it to later. Uh, and so that kind of delay is purposeful delay. Or even today, if something had come up with my children, I might have had to say, sorry, Max, I need to delay this. And that would sort of be an inevitable delay because I'm a father and I'm busy with other things. So delay is part of life. It can be very rational and purposeful, and it can lead to uh, more productivity and more happiness. But procrastination is a voluntary delay of an intended action, despite knowing you're probably going to be worse off for the delay. So it's a, a certain kind of a rational delay. And with that as the backdrop, I'll tell you how it affects us. First of all, it's related negatively to our performance. So typically, procrastination is never helpful. There are cer certain people who seem to pull it off, uh, but most people do more poorly when they procrastinate. And some people uh, will, will report the fact that they utterly fail. And it's the kind of thing that leads them to dropping out. So procrastination, first and foremost, it affects our, our performance. You can't do things at the last minute effectively, although you know maybe we'll come back to that because some people truly believe they can. They say they work better under pressure, but they don't. We, we, we see that they make more errors under pressure. It's that they only work under pressure. But let's, let's stay on the focus of how does it affect us? Well, not surprisingly, given my intro about why I started studying it, procrastination really affects our well-being. So people who report procrastinating are a lot less happy with their lives and they're very dissatisfied. They say, I hate myself for this. As much as I said, it typically affects performance. I've had many A plus students who were procrastinators, but they weren't happy. They say, why do I keep doing this to myself? And so there typically is it undermines our well-being, our, our happiness, self-reported happiness and our life satisfaction. One of the things we typically see with procrastination is a lot of guilt and negative emotions. And so that's not surprising that it affects our well-being. What interested me is I had a graduate student many years ago begin a line of research she's taken on now as a leading world researcher herself, Fuchsia Sirwa at uh, University of Sheffield in the UK. And she demonstrated over and over that procrastination affects our health negatively. Even she's demonstrated in a 2015 paper 
procrastination was related to heart to heart disease and wow. hypertension. But let me just back it up a bit and say, so how does procrastination relate to health, even stomach complaints and headaches and that sort of thing? Well, first of all, procrastination is related to higher stress. And stress, as we know, can take our bodies apart, right? That really never benefits us when we have chronic stress and procrastination does lead to that. But there's also two other interesting, we might say indirect effects, where stress you might think as a direct effect. The indirect effects are procrastinators typically put off wellness behaviors. So they don't sleep as much. They don't eat as well. They don't exercise. They put those things off too. And that undermines their health. And on top of all that, there's treatment delay. Oh, I'll get that looked after that later. Oh, I'll do my physio exercises later. And those things undermine our health. So procrastination is affecting performance, well-being, health. And as I even said, in that really mysterious paper, she showed that, Fuchsia showed, showed that it was related to coronary heart disease and hypertension. Mm -hmm. And when I said, Fuchsia, how does that work? Like, how do you, how do you connect <laughs> procrastination to heart disease? And she reminded me of the fact that we all know that the type A personality is related to heart disease. But it's not the fact that someone who is type A is really in, intense and busy. That's not what undermines them. It's an intra-psychic property. It's something to do with the way they're thinking and feeling, and it has a lot to do with hostility. So type A people who are very hostile have heart problems. Similarly, procrastinators who engage in a lot of self-blame, that's what she thinks is the mechanism going on there. Lots more research needs to be done, but you could see that procrastination affects us in lots of negative ways. One more thing though, because you asked me, why, did, why am I so interested in procrastination? Well, you and I, Max, have one limited resource and non-renewable resource in our life, and that is time, right? You can't make more time. And you and I don't even know how much time we actually have. I could die this afternoon, you could die this afternoon. We truly don't know. And so to waste time is rather absurd. In fact, I think that's why in every major world religion, they have this notion of a sin of sloth to waste one's life, not to do the things that you feel you ought to do or should do. And really that to me is the most profound issue with procrastination is that we don't live the lives that we want to live. We'll say, I want to exercise more. I want to eat better. I want to do better in my job or in my studies. And then we don't do the behaviors necessary to make those things happen. And that's the real tragedy of procrastination. We're not the people that we want to be. We don't live the lives that we want to live. So all those things, you can see that there's no upside to this thing called procrastination. That, that is so interesting. Actually, in, in one of your blog posts, I believe I've read this, this quote from you. You said, procrastination is failing to get on with life itself. Absolutely. That, that sums up what I was just trying to say. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and that, that, that's so incredible because when we, most people think about procrastination, you think about writing that paper at school, right? Or you think about, you know, not going to work out today because you just don't feel like it. But it has so many wider consequences that you're just talking about. That is, this really means that, that learning to take control of procrastination is really one of the most powerful things that we could do in our lives. Absolutely. And you know, it's fundamental. In fact, I really like the work of uh, Brene Brown. I got introduced to it by um, a lawyer, uh, a judge actually once it introduced me yeah. to this book. And I, I was a little reluctant because Brene is one of Oprah's favorites. And I thought, come on, what am I going to learn from this? <laughs> I'm a research psychologist. But in fact, yeah. so is Brene Brown. She, she was a researcher who studied shame. And then as if people that are listening might know, Brene Brown is famous for books on wholehearted living. And what she said was so profound when I read her book, uh, one of her books, she's read more, written more than one. She said, we have to, uh, we have to do, we have to understand what's getting in the way of what is doing what is best for us. We have to understand what's getting in the way. And procrastination is one of the things that gets in the way of our wholehearted living. And so, yeah, it's fundamental to living the lives you want to live. For sure, for sure. The, the way I always think about it is um, most people know exactly what they should do, right? We just don't get ourselves to, to do it, right? Yeah. So there's this quote from Derek Sivers, I believe. He said, um, if, if more knowledge was the answer, we'd all be billionaires with perfect apps, right? Like, <laughs> yes, yes. And my grandmother, my grandmother would say, if uh, wishes were 
horses beggars would be riders right that, that <laughs> yeah we all have good intentions and and there's another common expression the road to hell is paved with good intentions and that's interesting because we often define procrastination as the gap between intention and action so it is a problem of the human condition so with, with all these negative side effects why do we procrastinate like what is it in the in the human psyche that makes us want to you know put things off for later or never Oh, that's a great question. That's that's really the question we need to answer right now, which is, you know, we do things because the, the, the behaviorist told us this. We do things because they get reinforced, because they reward us somehow. So let's just step back for a moment and say, so why do we procrastinate? Well, we face a task. It's something we said we needed to do or we ought to do, we should do, even we want to do. But our whole body's screaming at us, I don't want to, I don't feel like it. <laughs> because we're having emotions and it might be boredom. It could be resentment. It could be frustration. It could be anxiety. But they're negative emotions. And typically we want to be happy not having negative emotions. So how do we get rid of those negative emotions? Well, they're attached to the task, right? I didn't have those emotions until I thought about doing this. So if I avoid the task, I can avoid the emotion. So in this wow. really important way, Procrastination is not a time management problem. It's an emotion management problem. Because here you are facing a task that you have in your calendar, your time management tool that you're supposed to work on today. But you look at it and say, oh, I don't want to, I don't feel like it. And I say, oh, I'll do it tomorrow. I'll feel more like it tomorrow. <laughs> and you get rid of those negative emotions, at least temporarily. So that's very reinforcing, very rewarding. Like typically we think of rewards as getting something, but behaviorists will tell you too that it's rewarding to get rid of negative things so if you step outside and it's raining and you put up an umbrella well the umbrella is reinforced by getting rid of the rain by getting rid of that negative stimulus and it's the same with procrastination when we avoid the task and we get rid of negative emotions that's very rewarding so we do it even though that future self is going to pay a cost now you made this this really interesting distinction between Prison and future self, and I'm always really interested by it by this by this idea that that like in the present now we, we're so focused on one thing that it, that may be bad for us, and we don't think about that future self that maybe you know six months from now and maybe you know even just one week from now when we have to turn in that paper, and we don't think about the future version of ourselves as much as, as that the present version. Yes, and that's a really interesting problem. There's a researcher by the name of Hal Hirschfield at UCLA, and he has done some fascinating research about present self and future self. In fact, he used functional magnetic resonance imaging, fMRI. Many people have had those kind of images done if they've ever had a, a head injury of some sort, fallen, uh, or had some growth in their head. Uh, but in this case, what we're looking at is the blood flow in the head. And we basically, it's correlational research where we say, oh, if the blood is here, this is the part of the brain that's working. And so he had people participate in uh, some research where they laid in the fMRI machine and he said, okay, I'd like you to think about your present self. And lo and, the, lo and behold, one part of the brain lights up. And he says, okay, I'd like you to think about a stranger. Not surprisingly, mm -hmm. a different part of the brain is processing information about a stranger. But what gets really interesting is Hal asked them to think about future self. And you're probably guessing the answer already. He found that the same part of the brain that processed information about a stranger was processing information about future self. So just the way the human brain is functioning, we seem to process information about future self more like a stranger. We sometimes feel that way when we're thinking about future self. We can't imagine ourselves in that person's skin the same way. We don't have the same empathy for future self and our focus is really myopic. We're thinking about ourselves, how we feel right now. I want to feel good now and future self can deal with the consequences. So that that's part of the, the puzzle right there. We we're not as rational as we think. That's, that is so interesting. And it makes so much sense. If, if we think about how we're living our lives, right? That like we never take care as much of our prep uh, future self as we take care of our present self. So, uh, why are some people more likely to procrastinate others? So, I mean, you mentioned those, those brain activity areas. Is that part of genetics maybe, or is it strategies or like, why are some people just more prone to procrastinate than others? Well, from, from what the research we have right now, it doesn't seem to be so much related to, uh, the strength of connecting present to future. Although we have done some research to show that the more 
uh, you, you can think about future self the less you will procrastinate. So that could play a, a, a part of the story, but we don't have a lot of research to document that. At this point, what I would say to you is that there are individual differences that make a difference in procrastination. So there are some major personality traits. And in fact, if we think there are three primary colors that make up all any other color, artists know this very well, personality psychologists would say, well, there are five major personality traits. And if you blend those, you get any other person. And you can remember the five by the mnemonic or the acronym of CANU. Uh, C for conscientiousness, A for agreeableness, N for neuroticism, O for openness to experience, and E for extroversion. Conscientiousness is how dutiful you are, how organized, how self-disciplined. And you can just taste that it's the opposite of procrastination. And lo and behold, people who are more conscientious procrastinate less. All of these major personality traits are both nature and nurture, of course. That no notion of is it nature or nurture, nature versus nurture, is misguided. It's always nature via nurture. The two are always dancing together. So these, all of these personality traits show heritabilities of about 50%. In other words, you have a predisposition when you're born to either be conscientious or not. But your, the experiences you have make a difference in your life. But if, as you listen to this, you'd say, gee, yeah, I'm not very organized or dutiful or self-disciplined. Well, the cards are stacked against you a little bit. You have a liability towards procrastination. Likewise, that third letter, N for neuroticism, which is really just emotional instability, is another personality trait that's related to procrastination. The less emotionally stable you are, the more likely you are to procrastinate, which isn't a surprise given what I've told you about procrastination being an emotion coping response, right? You're having negative emotions, you wanna get away from them, yeah. So those are a couple of the tr major traits that relate to it, but there's two others I'd tell you about. One about is, is impulsivity. If you're an impulsive person, someone who doesn't think things through, and it happens to be related a bit to conscientiousness, but if you're impulsive and you run away uh, at the, the slightest bit of frustration, well, you're more likely to procrastinate. Impulsive people are out of there before they even think about it. And certain kinds of perfectionists are more likely to procrastinate. Now, when I say certain kinds, that might surprise some listeners because you'll think, well, aren't perfectionists all the same? And the answer is no. Gord Flett from York University here in Canada is a world expert on perfectionism. And he would tell you there's three flavors of perfectionism. And I'll talk about two of them. One is the self-oriented perfectionist. This is someone who just tries to do a good job because that's the way she or he likes it. But then there's the socially prescribed perfectionist. Now, this oh. one, this person is someone who's trying to live up to the expectations of others. That's the notion of socially prescribed and these people are shown to procrastinate more in research studies. There's a correlation between how high you score on a measure of socially prescribed perfectionism and how often you procrastinate. And I would say the mechanism there is what you've already heard me talk about. And that is, if you're trying to live up to other people's standards, then you'll typically feel a sense of judgment uh, and that this weighs heavily on you emotionally. And it's just one more reason to want to avoid. So there's certainly things between people that make a difference in their tendency to procrastinate. That's so interesting. Okay, so so now for people that want to improve their ability to overcome procrastination, you already touched upon sort of uh, improving your, your emotional stability, lowering your impulsiveness. So what are some specific strategies or, or tactics or tools that people can use in order to overcome procrastination in their lives? Well, I'll start by saying that as much as I identified those things, I did call them personality traits, so they're not that mm -hmm. easy to change. So I, I wouldn't start by trying to necessarily to change how organized or dutiful I am. Uh, over time, you might be able to, but that's not probably going to help you this afternoon. But I, I will give you, uh, or whenever you happen to be listening to this podcast, right? That, but I can give you a strategy right now that can change your life right now. And it's truly it is a life changer if you want it to be. And that is... You know, when we face a task that is upsetting to us somehow, remember that doesn't mean that you're necessarily anxious, but it could be you're bored or you're resented. Like, why do I have to do this? Or you're frustrated by it. I don't even know how to do this. So you're having these negative emotions. Now we know from other research, you really can't suppress those emotions. You can't just wish them away. Even the Buddhists 
who know a lot about the mind from a spiritual tradition, not necessarily the psychological research we're talking about, but a long under tradition of an understanding of the mind will say, you know, people, we have monkey mind. It, we just have busy minds. Think and feel, think and feel. It's a busy place to be. And <sighs> the most profound thing I ever heard one Buddhist monk say is you have to give the monkey something to do. And so the, the strategy I'm going to give you just now speaks to that, that what is it? How can we give the monkey something to do? Well, instead of focusing on the fact that I resent this and I don't want to do this and I don't feel like doing this or I'm bored by this, I say to myself, what's the next action? I move from feeling to thinking about action. That's what I'm giving the monkey something to do. I say, hey, monkey, what's the next action? Now, I may add a little bit to that and I say, what's the next action if I was going to do this task, but I'm not? So now I'm doing a little bit of emotional regulation. I'm trying to trick myself a bit and procrastinators are good at self-deception. This is a good, a good trick we do. Say, what would be the next action I'd have to take on this if I was going to do this, but I'm not because I hate this. You'd say, oh, <laughs> well, I have to open my laptop and open my email. And you realize, well, I could do that. Like who couldn't open their laptop and open their email? So now all of a sudden I'm doing something. And I can tell you from our research that getting started is a magical moment. Now, if I just tell people to get started, they say, Tim, if I could get started, I wouldn't have a procrastination problem. So I say, yeah, you're right, you're right. Okay, so instead, ask yourself, and here it is again, this is a crucial step, I would argue, just for anybody. When your whole body's screaming, I don't want to, I don't feel like it, then say to yourself, what's the next action I would take on this? And make that action as small as possible, the lowest threshold that you can imagine doing. And what you'll find is that you realize, well, I could do that. Because once we start doing, the whole world changes. Oh, for sure. I've, I've realized this in my own life and like, I mean, really any field, right? When, when I'm running, for example, and I really don't feel like running, just putting on my running shoes and like going outside, like, and you get started and you run for one minute, right? Then it's easy to keep going. Max, you just nailed it. That's the perfect example. But the crazy thing about human beings, I know maybe you feel this way too, is that at one point in the day, you think, oh, I can't run today. But you, you do what you just said you do. You put on your shoes and you step outside and you just get started. Like 10 minutes later, you're quite sure you could run a marathon. Like you just yeah. go from not being able to do it to think we're some sort of super athlete, right? And we're, we are, as the behavioral economists say, predictably irrational. So that's a beautiful example, Max. It's funny because like about three weeks ago, I started jumping in, in the river here in the Rhine, which is flowing right through Basel and Switzerland here. And it's freezing cold, right? It's, it's seven degrees Celsius, which is probably like 40, 45 or so Fahrenheit. And so I started jumping in, right? In the beginning, it was so hard, right? And like, I have to push myself. And every time, you know, I go there, I just don't feel like it, right? But as soon as I'm in, like, as soon as, you know, I just start to swim in there, then it becomes easy in my mind, right? So it's, it's always like taking that first little plunge and then like everything afterwards becomes easier. And that's true for everything. You know, I think many listeners would say, well, of course, it's tough to jump in cold water. But then I like to do yoga. Yoga is very important to me because I'm 63 now and my body just needs that uh, exercise and stretching. And yet and, and on any given night, even though I really love yoga, I can think, oh, I don't feel like it. <laughs> and so all, I, I say, OK, Tim, what's the next action? Just put your mat on the floor and get on your mat. And, and of course, then once I'm started, I'm fine. So it's not even things that are so aversive, like jumping in cold water. I think, well, you're nuts, Max, for jumping in the cold yeah, water. Yeah, a little bit. <laughs> but you're not. No, I, I, I get what you're saying, but I just want listeners to know that that's true about so many things, even things that aren't nearly as arduous as jumping in cold water, even something as really rewarding as doing my yoga, I can still get to a point in the day where I go, oh, I don't want to. I'm thinking, why don't I want to? Oh, because I have to get my butt off this chair. <laughs> and then you realize how pathetic you are, right? And then you say... Okay, put your mat down, get on your mat and enjoy yourself. Yeah. I love that. Yeah, so, so a couple of weeks ago, I had this guy on a show called Bill Shaka. And he had this quote, it just stuck with me. He said, it's easier to act yourself into a new set of feelings than it is to feel yourself into a new set of actions. And it really sounds like, like that's what you're talking about here. Like it's, it's easier to just start to act and then you're going to feel like it rather than waiting for the feeling. Yeah, I, I say something very similar. And I think you'll find that on many people who do research on goal pursuit, uh, the breakdown in goal pursuit, uh, time management, because there's a whole group of people that are really expert on productivity. And we know that motivation follows action. 
not action following motivation. It's the same yeah. statement. And I often say that. And I, and I often wonder is why do we believe that we have to be in the mood? Because people will think it's an excuse. Well, I'm not in the mood. Who said you had to be in the mood? <laughs> I'm, I'm rare. Because I'll even joke with students when I'm talking to them, giving them a workshop on procrastination. I'll say, so how many times have you got up in the morning and someone says, hey, what do you want to do today? And you say a math assignment. Like, it just doesn't happen. <laughs> You're never in the mood necessarily to do that. Uh, but once you get going on it, well, it can feed your sense of competence, which is a basic human need. Uh, you realize you're accomplishing something that you need to get done to achieve other goals, and that's very rewarding. So typically, motivation is fueled by our activity, as you that quote said so well. Love that. That, that, is, that is so true. So, so other than really asking yourself every day, like, what's the next action? Do you have any other tips or strategies for people to use? Oh, absolutely. And so I'm going to go back to another cognitive one, one related to our thinking. And it comes uh, in the terms of this notion of an implementation intention. So we all have goal intentions, which is, which are, um, I might want to lose weight, or I might want to be more fit, or I might want to achieve A plus grades, and that sort of thing. But an implementation intention is uh, the work of a German psychologist, actually, is located in the U.S. And an implementation intention is this notion that in situation X, I'll do behavior Y. So it's a certain form of intention that says how and where am I going to implement it. It puts the stimulus for the action into the environment. And that's a big game changer because most of us work on autopilot. We're very habitual. And when you create this implementation intention, then what you're getting is you're creating a situation where in the environment is your cue for action. It takes you out of your habit for your second. So let me give you a practical example. The, I, I didn't mention the psychologist's name. His name is Peter Galwitzer. Uh, as I say, originally from Europe, and, and he's uh, now an American psychologist. Uh, but it, it's been his work and the work of his colleagues and students, and they've done so many studies to show how effective these are. But at one point in my own life, I was having a terrible time remembering to floss my teeth. I always brush my teeth, but brushing isn't enough for most people. Some people, some dentists now say you don't need to floss. And my good friends who are dentists say, don't believe them, floss your teeth. Right? <laughs> and, and yet I, I wasn't remembering. And part of me was being a, a little child saying, I don't feel like it. I don't want to. So I had to set an implementation intention. And it was such a simple one. Now I told you I always brushed my teeth. So I said, when I pick up my toothbrush, then I will put the floss on the counter. A simple if then statement. Now, embedded in there is the idea to achieve a sub-goal, and my sub-goal was to floss my teeth. And then my next implementation intention was, when I put down my toothbrush, then I'll pick up the floss. And that was the beginning of me flossing my teeth regularly. Now, some of you listening might say, you should floss your teeth before you brush. Yeah, I know, and I do now. But back then, I really needed to harness something I already was doing to create an implementation intention to make it more effective to add a new behavior into my habit. And now, of course, when I go into the bathroom, I have better prospective memory and I typically pick up the floss first. But just to show you how squirrely people are, there are days when I'm a little bit tired and, and uh, a very immature, almost like child inside of me says, I'm not gonna floss my teeth tonight. <laughs> and I think, Tim, when you pick up your toothbrush, put the floss in the counter. I go back to basics and I get it done. So, you know, what I'm trying to say too is that just because many of us can beat this procrastination habit doesn't mean somehow we become more virtuous or that we actually feel like it, is that these strategies can become very powerful tools that allow us to live the life we want to live, right? And have the gums, in this case, very specifically, we want to have. <laughs> so you asked me about other things. So one was, what's the next action? The next one was implementation intentions, a powerful technique that Peter Galwitzer and his colleagues have of uh, authored, but there's also this whole notion of emotional intelligence. And here I would bring in the notion of mindfulness. I've already told you that I'm a real fan of yoga. Well, my yoga involves a lot of concentrated breathing. And so I basically do mindfulness meditation as I do my physical stretching and yoga poses. And that mindfulness is so important because mindfulness, as many of your listeners might know, and I'm sure you know, Max, is that you're 
you're learning to develop a non-judgmental attitude towards how you're thinking and feeling. Basically, you're acknowledging, yes, I have monkey mind, but yeah. I don't have to be those thoughts. I don't have to be those feelings. I can acknowledge I have them without being them. I don't judge them. I just let them float by. And the more that you can foster that non-judgmental attitude, then when it comes to a task that make, just overwhelms you and you're having negative emotions about, you can say, yep, I really resent doing this. I can have resentment without being resentment. And then I lay on top of that, what's the next action? And you can see how these start to nest together. So that's really important. And another strategy is just thinking about things concretely. Now, it may sound like I'm asking you, what's the next action? But in this case, research shows that when we think about things concretely, they seem to belong to the present. But as we're, when we think about things abstractly, they, they don't seem to have any urgency to them. So let me give an example of someone says, so what are you doing this weekend? Oh, I got to work on my thesis or I have to read a book. That's very abstract. As opposed yeah. to saying, oh, I've got five more pages in chapter three to read. That's very concrete. So if you can make things as concrete as possible, it's not only then that it starts to sound like an implementation intention or what's the next action, but our brains in, in, in kind of encode it as this belongs to today. You should get this done. So these are some pretty typical strategies that are very helpful around procrastination. Wow, so, so much good stuff here. And I really want to talk about or touch upon very quickly what you said before about emotional intelligence. Uh, and you mentioned before about sort of catching your own inner child, right? So, mm -hmm. so realizing like, hey, this is sort of, you know, the, the little me talking, right? I call, I call myself like the, the little Max, right? That the guy that just wants like, you know, the immediate gratification and like that wants to do those stupid things that, that I consciously know that I shouldn't do, right? Whether it's eating mm -hmm. chocolate or procrastinating, whatever it is, right? Mm -hmm. So, so I love this idea of sort of, you know, looking at this, this little childish version of yourself and, you know, without being judgmental or anything, just realizing like, hey, those are the, the sort of impulses that my brain is sending to me, but I don't necessarily have to act upon it, right? No, but let's knock that up a not notch in our discussion because uh, listeners might be interested in some of the neuroscience behind that. So we can talk metaphorically about that inner child. But one thing we know about children is that their prefrontal cortex is underdeveloped. It hasn't matured yet, but their limbic system, what some people call the, the reptile brain, because we share it with species as, as uh, primitive as reptiles. And I don't mean that in a pejorative way, just in a structural way, that mm -hmm. this limbic system, this emotional system, what uh, some psychologists have called the fast brain, reacts quickly to the world. And it has that basic notion of feel good now. Uh, get what you want now. And yeah. so this is what children will operate on. Whereas what we're always trying to encourage and what happens when your prefrontal cortex matures is that no, you can in, uh, have these executive functions of the prefrontal cortex come into play where you inhibit impulses or you act on your plans instead. So this uh, child Max or child Tim, as the case may be, is really just an example of what Fuchsia Sirwa calls the amygdala hijack. You're letting your emotional brain dominate. And in fact, some researchers in Germany using fMRI showed that people who procrastinate more frequently than, than others have larger amygdala sizes, the volumes larger, representing oh, wow. uh, a physical characteristic that's correlated with this uh, psychological experience of being overwhelmed by our emotions. Now, the amygdala... Uh, works with the hippocampus is because the brain's all wired together, of course. And there, so there's all this um, processing going on in the encoding of memories and the amygdala's role in lots of ways is to encode emotion with it. So now if you've got this larger amygdala and you're encoding things emotionally, then you're more likely to procrastinate. And that's that Timmy self coming out or the, the little Mac self coming out. So uh, to take this full circle back to mindfulness, there's a researcher by the last name of Taryn at the University of Pittsburgh. In her research, she showed that even eight weeks of mindfulness actually served to shrink the size of the amygdala and change the connections with the prefrontal cortex. So we call this neuroplasticity. In other words, uh, what wires together fires together. And at the same time, biology is not destiny, that we can change our brains uh, by actively doing different things. So as much as we have this little person alive and well in us, I don't feel like it, I don't want to, 
we can get past that too. Wow, love that, love that, absolutely. Um, so powerful, I think, learning to to really regulate your emotions, right, and regulate that inner child within you. Um, now, with all these strategies, the reality is that that we're all going to fail at times, right? And you touched upon the shame that people oftentimes feel when they procrastinate and those negative feelings. So how should we deal with, with procrastination failure? So how should we deal with, you know, if, hey, yesterday I said I was going to do this and I didn't do it, and we feel that shame, we feel an embarrassment, how can we, like, deal with that and get out of that and start to, to act again? Well, I really appreciate you asking me that question because when you asked me about strategies, I was thinking, oh, I left out the notion of self-forgiveness. And, <laughs> and you've taken us back there in an important way because listeners need to know this for sure, uh, especially those who are struggling with their procrastination. And today they're excited about some new strategies and they try them for a while. And then one day they fall flat on their face and it, it could be tomorrow, right? Because change, yeah. change is hard. And what we found, I had a colleague at my own university a few years back say, Tim, we should do a study together because he knew lots about forgiveness. We should do a study on forgiveness and procrastination. And his name is Michael Wall. And I said, Michael, come on, it'll be forgive and forget. Like, what's the point of doing that? <laughs> and he said, oh, don't be so sure. And, and he was right. That's not what we found at all. In fact, and this is one study. You have to remember that, you know, I'm giving you the best story I can tell you based on the research we have. But most of this stuff needs to be replicated. Uh, but I think that, th that the, the story it weaves together it, it, uh, convinces me that there's something important here. And there's other researchers doing similar things now on self-compassion. But let me go back to where I was with Michael. So we did this study with some first-year students who were preparing for exams, and they procrastinated on their first exam, and they didn't do well. And of that group, just the procrastinators who didn't do well, some of them forgave themselves for that, and some didn't. And lo and behold, those who forgave themselves for procrastinating, the ones that I thought would be forgive and forget, they actually didn't procrastinate for preparation for the second exam. I said, Michael, how does that work? Like, why does that work? <laughs> and he said, well, imagine that you and Max had had a transgression against each other. What would be the motivation? Well, I said, well, it'd be avoidance. Like Max wouldn't want to talk to me and I wouldn't want to talk to Max. He said, yep. He said, and what would happen if Max forgave you or you forgave Max? Well, I said, well, the motivation would be approach then. He said, exactly. And he said, with procrastination, the transgression is against the self. And if you don't forgive yourself, you just add another whole layer of avoidance in there. All you want to do wow. is avoid yourself because you think, oh, I'm such a screw up. And you mentioned the word earlier. You start feeling not just guilt for procrastination, but shame. And shame is where you think there's something wrong with you. It's not just that you didn't uh, do what you said you'd do, which you can feel guilty about. Now you're starting to beat yourself up. But if you can forgive yourself, and this comes from a really basic notion of common humanity. And I've kind of mentioned that in passing where I said, you know, we're all human. You're going to procrastinate. It's part of the human condition to want to feel good now. And so when that happens to you, you have to offer yourself a little bit of self-forgiveness and understand, yep, to screw up like this is human. And that will help you say, okay, I know what to do next. I'm going to, I'm going to use the implementation intention. I'm going to focus on the next action and I'm going to get started just like Max puts on his running shoes and gets outside. Right. Then, and then we find that the motivation follows the action and we have a better day. Life's not perfect. It's always two steps forward, one step back. And when you have that moment, when you step back, you got to be there with some self-forgiveness. So thanks. Thanks for asking that question. That's an important one. Oh, for sure. It's, it's definitely important, I think, to, to really learn to forgive yourself when you screw up because we'll all do it at times, right? Like as, as part of life. Oh, um, but since we're already talking about failure, I always uh, like to ask about my guest's favorite failure in life, some failure in your life that, that actually allowed you later on to, to move forward, to become a better version of yourself, to really push yourself to new heights. So do you have a favorite failure in your life? <laughs> that's a bad question. That's a, yeah. really, that's a really challenging question. A favorite failure. Well, I failed often. Um, I just, I failed the other day. You know, it's funny. And I was trying to model it for my children. Um, some of you might know what clarified butter in butter is. It's called ghee. You just take butter and you boil off the water in it and, and the milk solids uh, come out of it. And then you're left with oil, basically. And what's great about ghee is that it's uh, room temperature stable for a long time. 
And wow, okay. I, I like to camp and I like to take butter. Well, if you take butter, it goes rancid quickly. But if you make ghee, it will be uh, preserved. And uh, it's common in India, uh, known as ghee, G-H-E-E. -E. Uh, but other places like North America, we often call it clarified butter. So I was making some for a camping trip and I made some already. And then I bought some quite expensive organic unsalted butter and I burned it and it went black. <laughs> and and I said to my children who were watching it, I said, well, I, that's awful. Like what a terrible mistake that is. So I said, but you know, you only learn when you make mistakes and you only learn when you admit what you don't know. So that was a common recent mistake, right? And, and I can think of other big life mistakes that might be too revealing for a, a podcast, but but we don't, we don't learn uh, until we admit what we don't know. And, and what the principle there, and it's not easy for human beings, and it takes me back to Bre Brene Brown in some ways, is we have to become vulnerable. We have to embrace our own vulnerability. And even as the famous Canadian poet Leonard Cohen says, you know, everything has a crack in it. That's how the light gets in. We have to Oof. understand that we're not perfect and that making mistakes is how we learn and and not knowing things is normal and that's when we learn again and it's when you don't want to make mistakes and close off that you also become really anxious and you're more likely to put things off you never take a risk so you know that's my answer to your question is that i make mistakes constantly i, I can make day-to-day -day mistakes so let's say i get tired and impatient and i raise my voice with my child well he, he or she doesn't need that right that that's yeah. that less lost control now and then i have to back up a little bit and think about my own emotional intelligence and and i learn from those mistakes yeah for sure and it's also interesting that you mentioned that that you're already also teaching it to your children right that this this idea of hey i made a mistake and i own it right like i i acknowledge it i accept it i'm like how can i learn right and then like you're already teaching that to your children so that's really interesting oh you have to because that's the only way to learn is by modeling and i could have gotten upset because i just wasted six dollars worth of butter and my time and i could feel insecure about my ability like wow how did, how can you screw up making ghee all you have to do is heat it right <laughs> but yeah it, it's it, but that's like everything in life that you you um you can take it personally or you can become vulnerable and accept that you're human and then stand back and say well, what do i have to learn here in fact i'll tell you an interesting story fuchsia, fuchsia sirwa again an outstanding research you might want to talk to her someday university of sheffield and uh she did some work on counterfactual thinking and procrastination. Now, counterfactual thinking sounds like what it, it is, what it sounds like, that you're thinking something counter from what is factual. So, for example, let's say I got into a car accident. I can make a counterfactual thought of having not gotten into the accident. I can make a counterfactual thought like, oh, at least no one was killed, which is a downward counterfactual. And of course, that makes me feel better. I'm in an accident, but at least yeah. no one was killed or an upward counterfactual, ah, I wouldn't have gotten in an accident if I had been paying attention. So upward counterfactuals we learn from. And so even burning the ghee, I had to take that as an opportunity to learn from it. Interestingly, what Fuchsia found in her research is that people who tend to procrastinate make more downward counterfactuals. So they're more likely to want to feel good. Again, it's always about emotional repair. Sometimes in order to learn, you have to be willing to ex experience the, the discomfort, right? Life ha involves some discomfort and some suffering. There's no way around that. Oh, for sure. I, th I think that's one of the, the greatest strategies in today's world is that we're, like, we're so focused on, on avoiding suffering at any cost, right? Mm -hmm. Whether it's working out or studying, like we always try to, to sort of avoid the pain and drown it out through like social media or Netflix or whatever it is, rather than just you know facing it. So I said, I love the point you're making here. Oh, for sure. And then the other people make that point by saying short-term pain, long-term gain. And that can be with in terms of saving money or studying or working out, all of these things, right? We need to be able to bring future self a bit closer. And we've certainly done some research on that as well. We had people uh, do a guided meditation to think more about future self. And sure enough, those people who did that we're able to develop more empathy for future self. And that empathy was related to less procrastination. So we do have to bring future self and present self together and realize that sometimes you have to work a bit now to reap the benefits later. Well, for sure, for sure, 100%. Now, before I ask my final question, where can listeners connect with you online? 
Well, my research website is procrastination.ca. So procrastination, obviously, because that's what I study. And .ca, just remember I'm in Canada. The CA of first two letters of Canada. And you'll see the kind of things my students and I are doing. And there's a link there to my own podcast. I started very early in podcasting and I'm not doing as much of it, but I still put up the odd episode when a student finishes a thesis or a colleague has something interesting to say. And then I, I write, oh, probably about once a month on average for Psychology Today. My blog, Don't Delay, is there. Ironic title, because I think delay is a part <laughs> of life, but that was given to me back in 2008. So if you're oh, interested, so you don't want to change it. No. And if, so if you're interested in the topic and there's something I've said today, you want to know more about, well, everything I've talked about, I've talked about in detail, uh, either in the blog or in the podcast. So that's where people could learn more about my work and this work of my students. Awesome. I'll put up the links to that then. So now final question, what does mental mastery mean to you? Mental mastery. Well, it's funny you'd ask me that question this week because just the other night, I, I got to it from the New York Times. There's a short movie about a free climber. So this is a person who climbs cliffs without any protection, no ropes. Wow. And he climbed uh, a 3,000 foot cliff, uh, <laughs> which has a famous name and it's just escaping me. I wish I could look it up, but it, it's not important. You'll be able to find it rather easily online. Um, he demonstrated true mental mastery because he climbed this 3000, I'm, I'm, I think it's 3000 feet and listeners can uh, say nasty things too in the comment section if they want to, but basically one of the biggest cliffs and uh, outstanding climbing areas in the United States. And he did it in three hours and 49 minutes and he did it without any protection. He trained for four or five years to do it. Many years he'd go, he said, no, I can't do that this year. And what he had to do was he rappelled down with a couple thousand feet of rope and he had to memorize every section because when he knew he was going to do it, he'd be doing there without any ropes, without any protection. And if he, if he missed, he was going to fall to his death. And wow. he demonstrated mental mastery like I'd never seen before. And to me now, that becomes my touchstone of what mental mastery meant because not only did he have to do that in preparation, but he speaks, oh, you, if you just YouTube it, I, I, uh, I, I watched him do a TED talk on this, on his climb. So free climbing on Ted talk. And I'm, I'm just terrible that I can't remember his name because he's such a uh, amazing human being. But what's most important for all of us is not only did he work on the mastery of the moves physically, he had to be able to deal with his emotions and anticipate some of his emotions. Cause he said to himself, okay, now when I get to the hardest part, what if I'm feeling tired and insecure? What am I going to do then? And I thought, wow, what a powerful metaphor for how we all feel when we face different things in life. So you know, mental mastery to me is the kind of introspection and work, just plain preparation that this young man did to free climb, to put his whole life on the line, to accomplish a goal that he wanted. And I think we could all learn something from him, not only in terms of, because it's, it's kind of far-fetched and not, most of us will never climb like that, but all of us need to be able to anticipate the kind of things he talks about, which was when I get in that situation, Am I actually going to feel like I feel right, like right now? Not necessarily. Okay, what am I going to do if I'm freaking out? Because <laughs> that will kill me. <laughs> yeah. and, and that to me is mental mastery. This, this deep sense of emotional intelligence that that man uh, demonstrated and his really unerring pursuit of a goal. He wanted to do this. And you and I each have goals in our lives like that. All right, guys, that's it for today. I really hope you enjoyed this episode. I hope you gained some valuable ideas, tips, tools, tricks, mindsets, belief systems that will hopefully inspire you to take your life to the next level. At the end of the day, guys, it's all about application. The only thing that's going to set you apart tomorrow from where you are today is how much action you take with those ideas that you gained. And so I really want to challenge you at this point to, you know, not just listen to this passively, to not just consume this, you know, passively just thinking about other things, but to really take those lessons, take those ideas that you just gained and start applying them to your life. So to really start taking action and sprinting towards those goals and those dreams that you have in your life. Now, guys, at this point, I want to ask you for a huge favor. If you enjoyed this episode, please consider heading over to iTunes and leaving a review as that helps me really grow the show and reach more people, impact even more people around the world. 
You know, if you have a family member, a friend, a loved one maybe that you think could benefit from this content, please consider, you know, sharing it with them, forwarding to them as that helps us really build a community of like-minded people that are all about maxing out their lives. Now guys, with that being said, thanks so much for tuning in today. I really, really appreciate it. Stay strong and see you tomorrow.